Maybe I'll see you. Now, I'm going to give you a lecture. Get ready now. I want you to take some notes. I'm going to give you a lecture, a very small one. And it's going to, the title of this lecture is called Coffee, Cocaine, and Watch Your Step. Okay? Coffee, Cocaine, and Watch Your Step. Now, to talk to you about coffee, cocaine, and watch your step, I need to take you to Latin America. Now, I could go to lots of different places in the world. I've been very lucky. I love to travel. That's one of the reasons I became a geographer. So far, I've been to 49 of 50 states and 55 different countries. Been on five continents, swum in all four oceans, and, uh, you know, just had a chance to see the world. I love just going out for the adventure and seeing new cultures and new places and waterfalls and whatever. So I'm going to take you to Latin America because that's my favorite place. I love Latin America because Latin America, by and large, is Hispanic culture. And although there are some exceptions, like Brazil, where Portuguese is the major language, Spanish is the major language. Now, Spanish is a language that I really like. And uh, I speak it very poorly. <laughs> but it doesn't make a damn bit of difference. Because uh, when I'm in Hispanic cultures, they're not like the French. You know, you make a grammatical mistake with the French, they won't talk with you. You're talking with somebody in a Spanish culture, and they're not only talking with you, they're, you know, they're using hands and everything, trying to get the words out of you. And when I'm talking to them, I just, they go, oh, señor, usted habla español? Oh, poquito. Yo hablo español, pero solamente presente. No pasado, no futuro. Solamente presente. Oh, señor, su español es perfecto. Bullshit, I know it's not perfect, I'm telling you. I can only speak in the present tense, that's it. Oh, that's good enough. You know, and it really is. Because if I told you I am here yesterday, you'd have a pretty good idea I was here yesterday. I didn't conjugate it. But they don't care about that, you know. And they'll help you out as much as possible. Now, what I'm going to do is take you down. Actually, I'm going to take you to the first country that doesn't speak Spanish. But it's a language very close to it. And uh, I'm going to take you to Brazil. Brazil is, is a really, really fascinating country. Now, I learned in the first session, those of you guys in the back can't see this board. So uh, if there's anything that you want me to repeat, and this is a lesson for you in your classes. If your teacher goes too fast, or if they use a vocabulary word you've never heard of and the spelling, you, know, you go, oh, hell, I don't know how to spell it. Get your hand up. Get it up. That's your right. You can't, you, you got to, you, the professor can't say, quit raising your hand, you're annoying me. <laughs> he's got to answer your questions because if he's going to expect you to answer a question based on a vocabulary word, he's got to make sure that you understood what the vocabulary word was. Well, Brazil's just a great country. I mean, if you look at South America, the entire country, or the entire continent, if you look at South America as an entire continent, Brazil covers over half of it. Brazil covers more than half of the Latin or South American continent. Half of it, more than half. That's a big country. It's the fifth largest country in the world. Fifth largest country in the world. That means it's big. It's got over 170 million citizens. So it's a big country with a lot of people, and it's got a lot of stuff going on. And it is a country that's fascinating to visit. I mean, you have not seen anything until you've been on the beach at Copacabana. I mean, it is just amazing. And the Brazilians are the most wonderful mixture of racial colors you ever saw in your life, and nobody's prejudiced because everybody's got a little bit of everything in them. And so they can't be, otherwise they'd be prejudiced against themselves. Uh, Brazil has skin colors that range all the way from white to ebony black, and cream, buff, tan, whatever, anything in between. And the Brazilian people are alive. I mean, the Brazilian people, I just saw a study, they are just been classified as the most sensuous people on the planet. I mean, Brazilians almost walk sensually. I mean, they are very focused on sensuality. And carnival is, I mean, it makes New Orleans and Mardi Gras look like a Sunday school picnic uh, to go to carnival in Rio de Janeiro. So it's a big country, lots of people, lots of resources, lots of things going for it. But one of the things that stand out, stands out, excuse me, Brazil is 
the number one coffee grower in the world, and has been for years and years and years. Now here's one of those listing type of things that you watch for when you're taking notes. Why is Brazil the number one coffee producer in the world? Well, you want to, you know, you're going to ask the question, what does coffee need? I mean, it's going to have to have certain physical characteristics. Okay. Coffee, number one, coffee likes to grow in the tropics. Coffee likes to grow in the tropics. That's number one. Now, while you're writing that down, that's the key point, and while you're writing that down, I'm just going to remind you what the tropics are. You remember a globe and you saw a line called the Tropic of Cancer at 23 and a half degrees north, and then you went down to 23 and a half degrees south, and there was the Tropic of Capricorn? So on the globe, everything between 23 and a half north and 23 and a half south is in the tropics, and the equator runs right through the middle of it. Well, why the tropics? Because coffee likes consistent temperatures, and temperatures do not change radically in the tropics. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you a city in Brazil called Manaus, M-A-N-A-U-S, Manaus. It's located on the Amazon River, right on the equator, fairly close, not smack on it, but very close. Here's the average temperature of the warmest month, 82 degrees. Here's the average temperature of the coldest month, 80. No season. 80 degrees in the coldest month, 82 in the warmest month. You know, you don't have to have a change of clothes down there. You don't need a coat. I mean, Manalus is very much like Houston in August, hot and humid. It's like living in an armpit. How many of you are from Houston? You know what I'm talking about. My God, half of you are from Houston. In Houston, this time of the year, you get out of the car and your clothes stick to you. And I mean, it's, it just makes you aggressive. Houstonians are kind of aggressive, particularly on your highways. How many of you are from Houston? Raise your hand. How many of you had driver's education? Well, almost all of you had driver's education. All right, when you had driver's education in Houston, did they teach you to drive with one hand? Yes, they did, because you had to have this one free so you could go like this. <laughs> Every time I go to Houston, that's all I see is, if, you know, it's like I'm not driving fast enough, so I get this, you know, I cut off, I get this, you know. It's, they're the one-armed drivers of Texas, is in Houston. And, you know, I was taught in driver's education, if you're going 60 miles an hour, for every 10 miles an hour, you're supposed to leave one car space between you and the car in front of you. So if you're going 60, how many spaces? Six. Try putting six spaces between you and the car in front of you in Houston. What happens? Five cars go in there. You know, that's just the way it is. And I say it's climatic determinism. I think you're aggressive. You can't help it. It's so hot and so sticky, and you're so damn mad, and your clothes stick to you, and you just, you know, and that makes you drive like that. That's the only thing I can figure out. So Manaus has that very tropical climate. That's number one. Number two, it doesn't like it real hot. It likes the consistency of the tropics, but it doesn't like it just, it doesn't like 80 degrees. So coffee is almost always grown up on the sides of mountains, usually between about 1,500 feet and 4,500 feet in elevation. 1,500 feet to 4,500 feet. Now, listen why that's important. Every time you go up 1,000 feet in elevation, the temperature cools, on average, 3.5 degrees. So if you go up 3,000 feet, it cools 10 degrees. That's what coffee likes. It likes that consistency that it gets in the tropic, but it likes the cooler temperatures you get on mountain slopes. And you know this from watching ads on coffee. It's always talking about mountain-grown coffee because that's where it gets away from the high heat. And the third factor on this list is rich volcanic soils, rich volcanic soils. And Brazil has a huge area of uplands called the Brazilian highlands and they're an old volcanic dome, so the soils that have developed on there are perfect for coffee. So it makes sense geographically why Brazil is the number one coffee producer. It has all three, all three things that we like to have for coffee, and you have it in abundance. So 
you kind of knew that just from coffee ads. I mean, you kind of had geography lessons on coffee ads. If I asked you on three, tell me who's the one person, just one person in the whole world that you associate with coffee. One, two, three, who? Juan Valdez. Juan Valdez. Damn, Juan Valdez and his happy-ass donkey. They're always going out someplace. And they only pick what? They pick the choicest beans. In a white suit, by the way, which makes a lot of sense. But you know that because you've seen those Juan Valdez commercials for, forever and ever. And at the end of the commercial, there's a little mountain goes up on the side of the can, and it goes Folgers, the best kind. It's mountain grown. So they go through all of those things. They talk about the rich tropical blends. They talk about the mountains, and, and they talk about the rich volcanic soils. So those are factors that you've seen in commercials. I don't know that Folgers knew they gave you a geography lesson, but that's the way it happened. One other thing about Brazil that's kind of interesting, if I could just do a little bit in each country, but uh, they're one of the few countries that in most cases have about 50% of their cars run on something called ethanol. Ethanol, now there was a story on the front page of the Austin paper today about there's about four stations on Interstate 35 in the Austin area where if you have a car that has the right carburation system, you can buy ethanol and it's 20 or 30 cents a gallon less. Ethanol is made from alcohol, and you can make alcohol from any kind of vegetation that you can ferment. I mean, how do we make what we drink? It's a fermentation process, isn't it? Rum is fermented sugar cane. Whiskey is fermented corn. Vodka is fermented potatoes. So. It's all a process of changing some kind of vegetation into alcohol. Well, the Brazilians never had much oil. So they started back in the 1980s running their cars with special carburation systems on alcohol. And when I was in Brazil, uh, it's been seven or eight years ago, I rented a car. And the guy that the car rental, because I didn't speak Portuguese and my Spanish was, like I said, only in the present tense, he was... He was almost a nervous wreck because he took me back to the back of the car and he took the cap off of the gas tank and he stuck his finger in it and he went, alcohol, alcohol, solamente, alcohol, alcohol. And I'm going, yeah, yeah. And he said, no gasolina, no gasolina. I said, God damn, give me the keys. I don't, you know, I want to go. I'm ready to go. When you go to a gas station in Brazil, you pull in and there's two islands. One of them says gasolina and the other one says alcohol because Brazil produces about 50% of what its cars run on from sugar cane. They're the largest sugar grower in the world, but they don't export sugar. They want to export alcohol to us. And I think you guys will live long enough, and you may not have to live too much longer, to see a major trend towards some alternative fuels, and we'll see a lot more alcohol-based gases. All right, the second country, oh, this is kind of funny. When they first started the program, they had gas stations set up, and these, these guys would pull into a gas station, and they'd put the hose in the tank, and then they would uh, go up to the gas station and put a few coins in a soft drink dispenser, and a can of Coke or Orange Crush or 7-Up would come out. Now, this stuff's 200-proof alcohol that he's putting in his car. So they go in, top off the tank, take three or four slugs out of here, top off the can, put the cap on, get in the car, start down the road. About a half hour later, they hit a train or a concrete bridge. Or whatever. That's almost pure, pure alcohol. I mean, they were so drunk within 30 minutes, they couldn't drive. And Brazil has been listed as having the worst automobile drivers in the world. But they were so bad because so many of them were driving drunk that the legislature in Brazil actually had to pass a law that the companies that made alcohol had to put an additive that tastes so bad you couldn't drink it to keep them from topping off their soft drink cans. All right, the next country I want to take you to is Bolivia. And Bolivia, we could say Bolivia is high in the Andes. Or I could say Bolivia is high in the Andes. Yeah, you got a pretty sharp group here today. You can have two kinds of highs, can't you? One of them could be altitude-induced, and the other one could be drug-induced. And you can get them both in Bolivia, okay? 
because Bolivia is very high. As a matter of fact, its capital, which is called La Paz, it's two words, L-A and then P-A-Z, and those of you who understand a little Spanish know that means the peace. So La Paz is the capital for legislative and administrative. Now, Bolivia is one of those crazy countries that actually has two capitals. There's another little capital. You don't have to get this down here. Sucre, that's where the Supreme Court is. So that's the judicial capital. But this is the important one. La Paz is the important one. Its elevation is 12,000 and three feet above sea level. 12,000 and three feet above sea level. Man, that's high. You guys from Houston, you're either at sea level or below. We know that because every time there's a hurricane, we see half of Houston underwater. When the helicopter show us the news that night, Houston's got great pockets that are below sea level. What's one, what city's even worse? New Orleans. I mean, you saw that when Katrina came in last year. It was totally underwater because the city's below sea level. So when the levees broke, too bad. All right, with La Paz, you're not close to sea level. 12,003 feet above sea level. The first time I went into La Paz, I went to the baggage claim, reached over, picked up my bags, and almost passed out. I had a thumping headache. I mean, my stomach was upset. I was dizzy. It was like I'd been drinking Mad Dog 2020 for two weeks, you know? <laughs> and I, you know? So the, my friend was picking me up, goes, Doc, you don't look very good. And I said, I don't feel very good. But I said, you have soroche. Soroche. S-O-R-O-C-H-E. S-O-R-O-C-H-E. Soroche is altitude sickness. And it's just because at 12,000 feet, there's not much oxygen. And if you're a flatlander, I mean, I'm from New Braunfels. We're 750 feet above sea level. And when I got to Bolivia, my system had a horrible time adjusting to that. But when I got to the house, the lady who was the mother of the boy that I was traveling with, he had been a student here, she said, Doc, sit down. And she got a coffee cup out, and she put a handful of these leaves in the coffee cup. And then she took a tea kettle and put boiling water on it. And she stirred it up, and it turned kind of like green tea. It was kind of a light green. And I took a sip, and it tasted pretty good. So I took another one and another one. I finished the cup, and I started feeling better. I said, can I have another cup of that? Sure. So she fixed me another cup. By the time the third one came around, I felt real good. Uh, and uh, I wasn't even paying any attention to it. What the hell did I do with my chalk? Oh, I got to this hand. <laughs> Getting late, guys. Hang on. Coca mate. Two words, coca mate. Coca mate is tea made from the leaf of the coca plant. C-O-C-A, the coca plant. The coca plant has a wonderful little leaf because the leaf contains a narcotic. And so I was getting a mild narcotic, which cured my soroche. Now, you can drink it as a tea, non-addictive. You'll never have any addiction. You won't have any problem. You can chew it. Things are going to get better, folks. <laughs> Until you get it in a little ball like that. Then you take your tongue and you push it up here. And you get another leaf and another one and another one. Until in about 30 minutes you have a wad about the size of a golf ball. <laughs> right here. Then when you've reached that stage... You pull it down, put it on the top of your tongue, and press it against the roof of your mouth as hard as you can. All the saliva and juice comes out. You don't spit, you swallow. <laughs> the hell, you think I was born yesterday? I'm talking about chewing coca leaves. Whatever the hell direction you want to go, go there on your own. <laughs> and that saliva has the, the narcotic cocaine in it. And man, I mean, you're just very relaxed. 
kind of a small rush, maybe just a little flushed. Uh, but you can do that. Bolivians chew it every day. Uh, most of the Indians in the mountains chew it every day, and they never have a problem. We, on the other hand, crush the leaf, extract the liquid, evaporate all of the, the liquid and concentrate it as a crystal called cocaine. Then we snort it up our noses to the tune of a multi-billion dollar industry that causes more crime and more family and social problems. I mean, the Indians of Bolivia know how to use the coca leaf. We don't, and so it causes major social problems for us. You know, there are, there are now plastic surgeons out in California that actually have a business built on putting Teflon implants in the noses of rock stars and, and movie stars because they snorted so much cocaine, they ate the lining out of their nose. So their nose drips all the time. You might even know some people. You know, if you know somebody that's talking to you and you're pretty sure they're a drug user, they go, and they go, damn allergies, cold, got damn allergies. Yeah, shit, I know what you got, you know. It has nothing to do with any kind of allergy. All right, the other thing in Bolivia that's kind of an interesting social thing, why don't you put my friend up there. The Bolivians are 55% are pure Indian. 55% uh, of the Bolivians are pure Indian. Okay? That's the highest Native American population in all of the Western Hemisphere. So they're mostly Indian, and they just elected an Indian, the very first Indian or Native American elected in the Western Hemisphere was elected about three months ago, Evo Morales. But they, they maintain, they're almost all Catholics, but they maintain some of their spiritual beliefs from the past, and this is one of them. You know, when I put that on my... Uh, overhead the first time I used it in class and I asked my students, what is that? And a girl goes, it's a duck. And I go, I'll be damned, that's the first four-legged duck I ever saw. <laughs> and she goes, no, 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 oh, she said it does have four legs. Well, I was looking at its beak. I thought it was a duck. Well, it does look a little bit like a beak. That, what you're looking at right there, and it's laying right over there, is a llama fetus. A llama fetus. And you can go to La Paz to a place called the Mercado de Brujas, the witch's market. And at the witch's market, you can buy those, which is what I did. I bought two of them because in their Indian spiritual beliefs, they believe it's necessary to bury a llama fetus under any new construction to keep the evil spirits away. So if you build a house, a school, a gymnasium, a recreational building, whatever building, a business building, you must bury a llama fetus. The, the actual, the workers on construction sites will not work until they know there's a llama fetus buried under the foundation. Yes? Uh, how much does a llama fetus cost? A llama fetus in, in Bolivia, I think I paid $6 for it. And I bought two of them, so I had 12. I had $12 I spent on. And, uh, of course, that's the sort of thing... Uh, you shouldn't bring through customs. But then a bag of coca, coca leaves is not supposed to. Hold up that bag, would you, Lindley? Ah, I've been real good with that. I just take a little at a time, you know. Uh, so, you know, when you're gray and fat and old, nobody pays any attention to you at customs. If they want drug smugglers, they use people like me. You know, they don't think we're ever going to do anything. So I go through and nobody even asks anything. But I get home and my wife opens up my suitcase to throw my clothes in the laundry. And she goes, good Lord, what is that smell? Oh, I said, that might be my llama fetuses. <laughs> You're what? Uh, my llama fetuses. What are you talking about? I said, oh, here. And I unwrapped the newspaper. And sure enough, that's where it was coming from. They hadn't finished rotting. Uh, they hadn't dried yet, so they were in the process. Well, it was rotting meat, and it, my clothes had to be washed three times to get the smell out of them. So she said, get those out of the house. So I took them out of the house, and I put them on some windowsills on my patio. Now, I have two cats. One cat I really love. This cat is a big, gray, furry one who sounds like a sewing machine. Brr, brr. I mean, she purrs all the time. She is what a cat should be. You pick her up, she just relaxes like a pillow. You pet her, pet her. You know, if you're under stress, you got the cat, she relaxes. The other cat is the cat from hell. <laughs> yeah, this cat is a bitch. 
And you know, you pick her up and her legs go straight out and her claws come out and she's scratching like this. You ungrateful bitch, I feed you, I clean your shit box, I do everything and then you scratch me like this. She went out on the patio and ate one of my lima, llama fetuses. She ate it. She's even more evil today than she was. Okay? But at any rate, they believe strongly in these issues. Those are just social. Some girl in the first presentation said, why do they do that? It's a tradition. You know, why do the Saudi Arabians not let women drive? It's a cultural tradition. And those traditions go back centuries and centuries. One last item. I told you that the, the, the uh, name of this lecture was Coffee, Cocaine, and Watch Your Step. The last place that I want to take you is very quickly to Peru, which most of you know is along the west coast of South America. And uh, Peru is a country that has a very interesting situation here. There's a cold water current that flows along the coast, and that draws fish. Cold water currents are the best places to fish. And there are two fish that dominate. One of them swims on the surface. It's called an anchovy. You all know what anchovies are. I mean, you've seen them, I would think. The other is a deep water fish, and it's called tuna. So tuna and anchovies are caught in extremely large numbers here. And that's one of Peru's major economic assets, is this wonderful fishing. But there's also another aspect to it, and that is the anchovies, which are surface swimming fish, there's a place out here, there's a few islands. And these islands are called the Chinchas Islands. C-H-I-N-C-H-A-S. C-H-I-N-C-H-A-S. The Chinchas Islands. The Chinchas Islands are not occupied by men. There are no human beings living out there. But one of the islands, one alone, has over six million seabirds. Because if you've got billions of anchovies swimming right on the surface, what's that going to attract? Seabirds. And seabirds have two goals in life, only two. And what are those two goals? One is to eat, and the other is to shit. One is to eat, one is to shit. Eat and shit, eat and shit, eat and shit. They eat all day and they shit all night. How much do they shit? That's the question. That's the academic question before you at this moment. How much do those seabirds shit? Some of those islands have deposits of shit 110 feet deep. 110 feet deep. What was the last part of the title of this lecture? Watch your step, Judas. You don't want to step in a pile of bird shit 110 feet deep, do you? Now you're sitting here going, can he really say shit? <laughs> I do. I'm kind of irreverent in that respect. I think shit is an extraordinarily useful word. You know, I, it's, it's a very, very descriptive word. You can use it so many different ways. You're full of bullshit. What the shit are you talking about? That crazy shit, did you see what he did? I mean, adverb, noun, verb, adjective, you can use it in so many ways and on an objective test. I have yet to have a student misspell shit. <laughs> Everybody knows how to spell it. So you ask the question then, why can't we use this word? What word Nazi said we can't use shit? Somebody's grandma didn't like it? Well, I mean, what can I use? Defecation. Oh, defecation, you like that? That's the scientific word for shit. <laughs> Farmers, what do they say? Oh, pile of manure. Be careful for the manure. And when you're a little kid and your mama has you in the park, she goes, oh, oh, watch out for the dog doo-doo. <laughs> doo-doo, manure, defecation, it's the same old shit in old Mexico. Guano. And if you've been in a cave, you've heard of bat guano. And if you've been in the Chinchas Islands, you've heard of bird guano. And that guano is actually very valuable. It's used for fertilizer, and it's, uh, it's harvested. I mean, they use front-end loaders on it to, to pick it up and haul it off to, get, or to fertilize their fields. Now, now that you know this new word, when you're home in Houston, 
where the driving is such as you know, and a car runs a red light and almost hits you, you can go, holy guano, Dad, watch out. <laughs> but you can't say holy shit, because if you leave today and you call your parents to let them know how freshman orientation goes, you can't say, oh, not too bad this afternoon. We had a professor gave us a lecture on shit. <laughs> because if you do, my culo will be de in deep iguano, okay? <laughs> All right, I hope I see some of you in class sometime during your career here. You've been great this afternoon. Lindley's going to work with you on what you did on your notes, okay?